You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 9, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pathogenesis of asthma. Our presenter is Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser. He's a past president of the World Allergy Organization and the past president of the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Good morning, everybody. It's July 9th here. Um, Welcome to Conferences Online and Allergy. This is our initial presentation for the start of our what we call the summer series here. It's roughly three months of intense topics. Um, Obviously, we'll continue to do that throughout the year, too. But um, this is to get uh, new fellows up and running on a lot of very important topics that they need to know as they move through uh, clinic. Um, Today, we're honored to have Dr. Lanny Rosenwasser, who is past president of the World Allergy Organization. And we were also um, fortunate enough at Merck to have Lanny work with us for, I don't know, what, about a decade or so of your career? Yeah, it was about 12 years. 12 years, yep. All right, very good. So we certainly miss you. uh, Very nice. Yeah, Yeah, I miss everybody, too. Yeah, yeah, we, we we miss having you here. Um, we were fortunate to have you, and um, but we're also lucky to have you back today. Uh, you're going to be talking about uh, human asthma pathogenesis. Um, so I'll let you t- take off and get it running here. Thanks so much. Thank you, Chris. Real pleasure to be able to speak with uh, the fellows and uh, faculty at Children's Mercy. I certainly enjoyed my time there. I also want to congratulate uh, Paul Dowling on his retirement and his movement into the West, and hopefully he'll have a very nice time in Utah. So uh, uh, I look forward to seeing everybody once we start having face-to-face meetings again this year. At any rate, I'm going to be talking about human asthma, and I'm going to give you a synthesis of my approach to the pathogenesis of asthma. And then um, uh, over the past 10 years or so, we've made great strides in asthma treatment. So we'll touch on some of those aspects where I think um, some of the treatments that have been pathogenesis-driven uh, made a difference in, uh, in asthma care. So let's go to the next slide, which is just a cartoon, I believe. Uh, yeah, it's uh, my disclosure. Next slide. Uh, I am on the um, DMC for the precise uh, network of NHLBI, so I'm involved in that at prospect in that project. I've also been a consultant for Avion Pharmaceuticals about utilizing colchicine in COVID. And uh, I've worked for the last 10 or 12 years with Sanofi and Regeneron for the IDMC for Dupilumab and uh, for some of their other uh, agents, which we'll mention as well, uh, which does have impact on asthma. But I can assure you that I have no, uh, no bias other than disclosing this. Next slide. I certainly have no financial interest in uh, in uh, any of those organizations. The definition definition of asthma really crystallized about 30 years ago uh, when the uh, identification of immune responses and airway inflammation was a critical part of uh, the definition of asthma. Asthma is narrowing of the airways, airway obstruction, and increased airway responsiveness with airway inflammation as being a hallmark, if not the major driving force uh, for this kind of process. In the 1980s, um, development of uh, um, uh, biopsy techniques in asthma uh, done predominantly by aggressive pulmonologists uh, led to a a good uh, and much better understanding of the uh, actual pathology of of asthma, which has led to uh, our understanding of a new new treatment paradigms. Um, I can tell you 40 years ago, Dr. Richard Farr, who I'm sure many of you have never heard of, uh, but at one time was the chairman of medicine and also director of allergy at National Jewish Hospital for about 25 years. Uh, He told me that he thought that um, asthma was no longer a problem for immunologists in that it was twitchy airways and it was going to be due to excess production of something called platelet activating factor by mast cells and that was going to be the whole the whole answer to asthma 
and he was completely dead wrong, even though he was one of the brilliant leaders of our field in the in, in, in by history. So okay. Uh, hello, hello. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, it's easier, I think, if we save the questions for later. Next slide. Besides the characteristics of asthma, which have clinical implications, the histopathology has been developed that identifies denudation of airway epithelium, thickening of the base of the airway beneath the basement membrane uh, with edema and immune cell activation, mast cell activation, and infiltration with a lot of inflammatory cells. And also, as we'll mention, uh, the, the d definition of a newer class of inflammatory cells called um, ILCs. Or okay, next slide, please. Besides the immunohistopathology, there's actually f uh, physiologic consequences. Can you go back? I think we skipped the slide. Well, maybe not. I thought we did. All right. Inflammation and asthma is very, very uh, prominent. You can see here a thickened basement membrane and a uh, uh, inflammatory exudate beneath the epithelium and above the smooth muscle that's part of the airway conducting bronchi and, uh, and, and airways. Uh, the uh, infiltration in about 85% of patients with asthma is predominantly eosinophilic. Even in non-allergic asthma, uh, there is a predominant of a type 2 immune response. Next slide. That is a predominantly eosinophilic. And you can see here the pictures of an eosinophil-rich infiltrate uh, below the uh, epithelium. Besides the inf infiltration with eosinophils, next slide. We see denudation of uh, epithelium. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of an airway uh, in asthma where you can see ciliated epithelium uh, that's normal on the left side and uh, damaged and ravaged epithelium that's essentially denuded uh, in, in, uh, in allergic inflammation and other inflammation associated with asthma. Next slide, please. Um, this is a subject of airway remodeling, the subepithelial fibrosis and airway wall thickening. There's an increased myocyte mass related to the development of myofibroblasts from fibroblast precursors within the airway that become hyperplastic. There's also mucus metaplasia and excess mucus production as part of this airway remodeling uh, function. Next slide. Maybe this is where I have the physiology. There is uh, physiologic consequences of airway remodeling, and that includes irreversible or partially reversible airway obstruction. Most asthmatic airway obstruction, especially in the newly diagnosed cases, are almost completely reversible. But as asthma process uh, is in place for almost decades, the, there becomes the development of a partially reversible and somewhat irreversible airway obstruction. And that's thought to do, be due, uh, at least in part, to the remodeling process. Airway hyperresponsiveness is also associated with uh, remodeling. And I'm not aware of any studies that dissect airway hyperresponsiveness from remodeling. Um, one of the other points about the airway epithelium potentially uh, playing a major role in this process that identifies it as a separate process from normal is that if you look at controls that are non-asthmatic, not exposed to any kind of airway toxins like pollution or smoking, and compare asthmatics who have uh, airway responsiveness in the definition identified previously in the presentation, if one looks at those individuals who have an asthma diagnosis versus controls, there's a greater decline in FEV1 that occurs in that asthmatic population as opposed to control population, uh, controlling for all the other factors such as age and size, et cetera. That identifies probably an intrinsic defect in the airway in asthmatics that you don't see in normal controls. And um, this decline in FEV1 is seen in everyone. So um, 
even if you're a mile mile runner and if you do marathons, uh, you will still lose 22 mLs of airway function, FEV1, per year after the age of 20, where your FEV1 is peak for almost everyone. That fall off is 38 mLs per year in asthmatics who, uh, with or without any kind of issues related to their treatment or other kinds of process. So there's an intrinsic defect in asthmatic lung that's not present in controls. And what that is may be tied to aging, may be tied to other kinds of factors that are important in asthma. Next slide. About 15 years ago, this is how everybody thought about asthma, that uh, external materials and environmental factors, including allergens, activated the Th2 arm of immunity to generate factors that get inflammatory cells in the airway and that damage the uh, epithelium indirectly through the activation of the Th2 arm of immunity that's specific. Now, that process probably does exist, but it's not the overwhelming or driving idea about pathogenesis that we have now. What's more, more uh, accepted now as a pathogenesis in place of this construct, next slide, is the idea that the epithelium is the real target for the development of asthma and that the um, response of epithelium to uh, environmental assault with allergens, toxins, viruses, particulates, bacteria, leads to an immune response uh, that is um, geared towards repair and generation of inflammatory factors that leads to the development of multiple uh, um, inflammatory cells, including Th2 lymphocytes, but also the uh, innate lymphoid cells, which we'll mention, eosinophils, mast cells, neutrophils, all of which can play a role in generating airway responses that uh, attack both the epithelium and the uh, airway smooth muscle and, and other aspects that alter physiology. It's also worth noting that the epithelium itself, under attack by these factors, can undergo changes that are epigenetic in nature, so that one um, may recover from a virus, but the epithelium may be altered in such a way that you may get a tendency towards development of airway responsiveness. So this now, as an immunologist who sort of developed my career looking at Th2 immune responses, this was deflating because the Th2 T cells were now just one of many kinds of uh, factors that generated an inflammatory immune response. But in fact, um, it's a recognition that the process is a much more um, uh, sort of holistic process uh, for the generation of the disease. And besides the epigenetic aspects of the epithelium, there's also activation of the entire innate immune response independent of the innate lymphoid cells that contribute to this process through dendritic cells and macrophage and other cells that might infiltrate the, uh, the epithelium during uh, response. So the pathogenesis is broadened and becomes a lot closer to reality when you actually think about it. And we'll talk about the therapeutic implications of that as we move through the process of, uh, of this presentation. Next slide. just identifies that not only are there uh, these factors involved at the epithelial junction and through the immune cells, but there's actually signaling cells that, or signaling molecules, excuse me, that interact at the subcellular level to generate either a pro-inflammatory response or other responses that are associated with asthma. So um, TNF receptors, T cell, B cell receptors, generate uh, ICAPA K kinase activation that leads to inflammatory cytokine production. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, things like toll-like receptor activation and interleukin-1 receptor activation generates an alternate set of uh, signaling molecules that may play a role and may crosstalk in the epithelium and in the inflammatory cells associated with asthma. And it's becoming clear that now some people are thinking about uh, kinase inhibitors as treatments 
not only for the inflammation associated with allergic responses in asthma or asthma itself, but also even atopic dermatitis and other immune allergic TH2 type of type 2 immune responses that might be kinase dependent, either through JAK kinases or MAP kinases or a variety of these other signaling molecules. So this becomes another level of interaction for inflammatory responses that play a role in asthma pathogenesis. Next slide. One of the uh, ways in which one thinks about this is that the asthmatic airway is a milieu that generates activation. From the point of view of CD4 T cells, depending on the inflammatory factors being present, one can either get Th1, Th2, Th17, or regulatory T cells, amongst others, which we'll mention in a slide or two. But it's the cytokine milieu and the signaling that that cytokine milieu generates that leads to these differentiated cells. And the other point about this is that these are not terminally differentiated cells. So one could get plasticity in this response. So if you have a high IL-4 background and a lot of GATA3, STAT6 activation, if you cut down on the amount of IL-4, those Th2 cells can regress back to the native or naive uh, state uh, as the process is altered uh, in, in this balance of cytokine milieu. So this is an important concept. There's plasticity in these cellular interactions identified here for the CD4 T cells. So the Th17 cells are important pro-inflammatory cells, especially in atopic dermatitis and, um, and, uh, and, and psoriasis even. You require a different set of uh, cytokines like TGF-beta and IL-6 and activation molecules like uh, ROR2-alpha in humans and STAT3 to generate the response. In atopic dermatitis, further exposure to IL-22 will lead to TH22 responses, which are also active in atopic dermatitis and even psoriasis. So there's a wide variety of the way in which these cells interact. This is just a model for the T-cell component of it, but the cytokine milieu plays a role in activation of all other cells in the innate immune response and in other inflammatory responses in the airway in asthma. Next slide. One of the important subsets of T cells that are of, of, of great importance for allergic responses are antigen-specific regulatory T lymphocytes that get generated that specifically can turn off uh, immune responses that are specific. It's been shown, for example, in uh, bee workers who are Vespid sensitive that these regulatory T cells develop and actually mediate the tolerance that those kinds of individuals get. And with immunotherapy, these T regulatory lymphocytes get increased. They express TGF beta and IL 10, they suppress other T cells, and they have the unique transcription factor FOXP3. And there's IL-35 growth factor for this particular subset as well. Uh, so this is an important subset because it may mediate a lot of the allergen-specific tolerance that one sees in various treatment as well as basic uh, immune response models. Uh, CD25, besides CD4, on these regular T regulatory T cells, CD25 is the receptor for IL-2. And so IL-2 can activate these regulatory T lymphocytes besides IL-35. Next slide. There are other cells and T-cell subsets, gamma-delta T-cells, NK T-cells and innate NK T-cells, Th22 cells, which I mentioned in some of the skin models, Th9 cells, which are seen to be very important in the generation of mast cell differentiation along with IL-4. And uh, T follicular dendritic, uh, follicular T cells found in, in the lymph nodes uh, after immunization and thought to be the specific um, source of a lot of the IL-4 and IL-13 generated in the response, T cell response that leads to IgE and other pro-inflammatory activities uh, that are IgE dependent. So these TFH CD4 follicular T-cells are important for IgE. Next slide. 
over the past 10 or 12 years, it's become clear that you don't necessarily need specific T cells to generate the activities of the um, of the T cell mediated responses. So there are innate lymphoid cell group one that can make Th1 cytokines. Again, subject to the milieu of cytokines that generate Th1 responses, like, for example, IL-12 uh, and possibly IL-18. Uh, Th2 cytokines generated by the effect of uh, of uh, IL-4 and, uh, and, and a variety of other cytokines that generate GATA-3. And the ILC innate lymphoid cell group 3 that mimic the kinds of uh, responses that one sees with IL-17 and IL-22 type of uh, TH uh, cells. So these innate lymphoid cells mean you can get the same type 2 inflammation, for example, if you have activation of ILC group 2, you can get the same kind of inflammation that you see with an allergic response to an allergen in the absence of the allergen. So 85% of asthma is type 2 immune response driven. Not all of it is driven by allergen, uh, but some of it is. So it's worth keeping in mind. But the actual initial event, initiating events, probably have less to do with allergen and more to do with the factors that generate um, a t type 2 immune response independent of uh, specific responses, namely with the innate lymphoid cells and then other aspects of innate immunity, including TLRs and IL-1, for example, that activated the uh, kinases on the right side of the slide a few slides ago. So these are worthwhile things to keep in mind for pathogenesis. Next slide, please. Asthma is a very complex disease, um, and it's worth keeping in mind whether or not you know all these different acronyms and numbers and different things. Uh, it's got um, several orders of magnitude of complexity, starting with the microbiome, which is the microbial content, if you will, of the airway, the proteome, transcriptome, genome of the responding epithelium and the inflammatory cells that make up the cellular mix that we've just mentioned, uh, and certainly genes and then epigenes are very important in this process. And then tissues, organs, whole body, and even brain makes an influence in the uh, response to whatever it is that's generating symptoms in asthma. And then I list here third and fourth dimensions. Third meaning for all these cartoons I'm showing you, they're written down in, in in two, uh, two dimensions as cartoons, but they represent the three-dimensional interactions of ligands, receptors, cellular interactions within, t within tissues that are, uh, uh, that are all three-dimensional as well. And it all occurs over fourth dimensions, namely time. So uh, asthma in a four-year-old is entirely different than asthma in a 30-year-old or a 50-year-old. So the fourth dimension of time and development plays a role in which this complexity plays out. So it's not surprising. Next slide. Next slide, please. It's not surprising that we have a complex algorithm to handle uh, treatment and characterization of the symptoms uh, in uh, asthma. This is GINA 2020, about a year old, uh, that identifies a summary of how symptoms and uh, function could be associated with step one to step five severity with different treatment algorithms at each of these different steps. So intermittent asthma, symptoms less than twice a month, uh, an as-needed kind of approach to treatment might be the best approach. For step two, symptoms are more common and a more aggressive uh, treatment with different kinds of treatments listed here to come into effect. Uh, step three means uh, uh, another step towards more uh, activity of disease and symptomatology. Step four and five really being the most severe uh, kinds of asthma. And we'll talk about severe asthma in a moment or two in terms of how to make a definition of what step four or five means. 
generally high dose, medium dose to high dose inhaled steroids and long acting beta agonists are required. A variety of other therapies can be added on, including other bronchodilators like uh, teotropium, which is a, uh, 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 a methacholine kind of antagonist, or uh, uh, leukotriene receptor antagonist, and immunotherapy in the proper group of individuals who have asthma that's clearly triggered by, um, by allergens. So there's a variety of things that could be done before step three or four, actually, to mitigate, uh, depending on the uh, degree of clinical symptomatology. And for step five, uh, we'll go into the, the different treatment algorithms that are really pathogenesis-based to some degree. Okay, next slide. So severe asthma, according to the definition from an ATS-ERS task force, uh, is asthma generally at the step four or five level from GINA, in which high-dose inhaled steroids and a second controller have been in use for a previous year, with or without full resolution of symptomatology. And in those individuals who require enough steroid bursts, that 50% of their year is taken over with the use of uh, systemic steroids. And um, for severe asthma, there's lack of control despite this kind of therapeutic approach. Next slide. Identify some of the other uh, assessments of control. ACQ and ACT, which are uh, uh, symptom scores that are utilized to identify uh, exacerbation-prone asthmatics or lack of control. And then other guidelines. Uh, NAEP actually is just revised in the last year, and GINA guidelines, which we went through. Frequent exacerbations are an assessment of lack of control. Serious uh, exacerbations, sometimes requiring hospitalizations, ICU, intubations, etc., and some degree of airflow limitations. Uh, luckily, ATS-ERS did not put any numbers on airflow limitation related to severe asthma, but needless to say, there's clear uh, airflow limitation in these patients. Next slide. The overall treatment involves long-term controller medications. And this is a slide that's almost as old as the definition of asthma I gave you. Uh, and the long-term controllers are inhaled steroids, long-acting beta agonist, long-acting anticholinergics like teotropium, leukotriene modifiers. Quick relief is given with uh, short-acting beta agonist, anticholinergics, and systemic glucocorticoid pulses, either by parenteral and or um, uh, int intravenous or other kinds of parenteral administration or oral administration. So those are quick, quick relievers. As we've identified uh, the severe asthmatics at the level of step four and five GINA the past 15 years. Next slide. We have a list of materials that could be potentially utilized as agents for severe asthma. Omalizumab we have had for about 15 years, and it has done yeoman's work in terms of the next step of severity. Uh, and it clearly has had real-life data that has been published multiple times about its uh, efficacy in severe asthma. Methotrexate has less of a positive uh, role, and it's generally not utilized. Macrolides, there's a lot of controversy about whether macrolides have an effect in severe asthma control, again, borderline. The same for antifungals, although there are clearly some severe asthmatics who do have some issues with fungal immunity and the ability to clear fungal uh, either commensals or, or, in, or, in, or infecting agents. Uh, in those individuals who don't respond even to omalizumab or any of these other issues, who don't have a lot of inflammatory components to their asthma, maybe about a 10%, 15% uh, group of uh, severe asthmatics. Bronchial thermoplasty has been shown to be a potentially useful agent. Muscarinic antagonists uh, like teotropium have been utilized as bronchodilating agents where the long and short acting bronchodilators in a very small subset of asthmatics don't work well. And finally, anticytokines, which over the past 10 years or so 
have been sort of the new agents uh, that have been utilized in severe asthma. Next slide. Anti-IgE, as I said, has been utilized for about 15 years. It reduces high and low affinity uh, IgEFC receptors, so it's uh, clearly got an effect on the way in which the inflammatory cells function. It reduces free IgE and as such reduces those receptors. I think that's the major way in which this work works. The anti-IgE probably does very little in terms of uh, neutralizing potential allergen reactivity. It has more effects than what I've mentioned. It's shown to have efficacy in asthma, allergic rhinitis, although it's not a treatment of choice in that, uh, and also uh, urticaria. It could be used for uh, severe chronic rhinosinusitis with polyposis. So while AR is generally not a good indication, chronic rhinosinusitis with polyposis probably will respond to IgE, anti-IgE, omalizumab, or Zolaire. Uh, there are higher affinity anti-IgEs that have been developed, legolezumab, I think it's called, um, and it's been shown to have the same kind of therapeutic spectrum that, uh, that omalizumab has, so I'm not sure its efficacy is much, much better, but uh, it's also something that you'll encounter in your reading. Next slide. Besides anti-IgE, the um, biotherapeutic uh, realm of treatment of severe asthma has exploded over the past 10 years, predominantly with the anti-IL-5 agents and anti-IL-4-13. Anti-IL-4 alone, anti-IL-13 alone are probably have minor efficacies but don't do as well as blocking both together, which is what you get with the agent dupilumab. Anti-IL-1 we'll talk about because IL-1 is of interest to me. And the IL-1 family includes IL-33, which has become a very important potential target for type 2 immune responses in asthma and other allergic diseases. Anti-IL-17 is somewhat controversial as well. Uh, it hasn't been shown to be that efficacious. We'll make a couple points about it as we go through the talk. Let's go on to the next one. Um, just identifies the agents. None of these anti-IL-4 agents will ever be approved, I don't think, on their own. The anti-IL-5s are in clinical practice. I don't believe many of these anti-IL-13 agents are ever going to be approved as freestanding agents, especially since I don't think any of them come close to the efficacy of dupilumab, which blocks both IL-4 and IL-13. And there's an Amgen agent that hadn't been approved uh, and I don't think it's in development any longer, called AMG317. There are anti-TSLPs, tezapelumab, which um, is being produced by uh, Amgen, AstraZeneca, and Genentech, and I think will come to market within a year after approval. The anti-IL-33s will come for approval shortly thereafter. Um, there's Regeneron, which is producing something called IPA, in a, in a Pacamad, I've got it written down later on, it actually has a name. And there's another anti-IL-33 that I don't think will be approved, but I, I believe that the Regeneron one will, uh, since some of the preliminary data looks very uh, promising. Next slide. Uh, dupilumab is a dual inhibitor of IL-4 and IL-13. These are key cytokines for type 2 immune inflammation with or without allergen-driven TH2 responses. Um, the dupilumab is a fully humanized, high-affinity monoclonal against the IL-4 receptor alpha. The IL-4 receptor alpha and a, it, it becomes a hydrodimer with the IL-13 receptor alpha-1 to bind both IL-4 and IL-13. IL-4 will bind IL-4 receptor alpha with the common gamma chain associated with cytokine binding as a pure IL-4 activation, a type 1 receptor here. And you can see the JAK kinases and STATs that get activated with these cytokine activations. There's a decoy receptor, IL-13 receptor alpha-2, which doesn't play a physiologic role in asthma. Um, but the issue is that both uh, IL-4 and IL-13 will be blocked by dupilumab's effect on the IL-4 receptor alpha, 
So um, that's a very useful combination, needless to say. Next slide. Dupelumab has been going through significant clinical trials in atopic dermatitis, in asthma, now as well in uh, EOE, also chronic rhinosinusitis with or without polyposis, and it's gotten uh, approval for all of those distinctions as well. It's been approved below up to up to age 12, age 12 and above in asthma, but for atopic dermatitis, it's been approved between ages 6 and 11, and there are studies ongoing between six months and, uh, and six years, two years, two to five years. So there are a lot of pediatric data that will be coming out that may influence the indication uh, for dupilumab. But needless to say, it's been approved for all of these indications. Next slide. I think just summarizes that. Yeah, Dupixent is its um, brand name, uh, and it's approved asthma, atopic dermatitis, chronic rhinosinusitis with polyposis. And if it hasn't been approved for EOA, it'll be approved pretty shortly, I'm, um, I'm sure. Next slide. Uh, it addresses the unmet needs in the step four or five, uh, but it's not the only thing that addresses those needs. We've already talked about omalizumab affecting a significant group of those patients as well over the years. And then any of the anti-IL-5 agents where there's hypereosinophilia associated with step four or five asthma all have efficacy. Next slide. And just identifies um, how uh, dupilumab could affect a, a variety of these type 2, TH2 type of models for asthma, ranging from allergic asthma, eosinophilic asthma, exercise-induced asthma. The dupilumab is the only one of these biologics that shows proven efficacy in the lower eosinophil component of severe asthma. And while it's not as impressive as what it does with the higher eosinophil asthma, it still has a positive effect on both FEV1 and reduction of exacerbation in lower eosinophil type of asthma as well. The anti-IL-5 agents, which we'll mention a little more detail in a moment, mepolizumab, reslizumab, benralizumab, also have significant effects predominantly in eosinophilic asthma. Next slide. I think begins this discussion of uh, the role of IL-5 in asthma, blocking IL-5 in a variety of manners, it's been shown to improve asthma over the past 10 or 12 years. Next slide, just is just some of the original preliminary data from the UK and Canada that showed mepolizumab interfering with asthmatic exacerbations and other kinds of physiologic and immunologic functions uh, from studies done now 11, 12 years ago. Next slide uh, is the same kind of... Uh, data looking at some of the other kinds of activities, including uh, ACQ, et cetera. So there's a variety of benefits. There's probably two dozen papers on anti-IL-5 and human asthma with mepolizumab, uh, with benralizumab, and with reslizumab. Mepolizumab and reslizumab block IL-5 directly as a ligand, and um, benralizumab uh, binds to the IL-5 receptor alpha, which is the main receptor for IL-5 on a variety of cells. Next slide, I think, is just a, a description of the studies with the reslizumab to show it's a equivalent to, to, to um, uh, mepolizumab and benralizumab. There are fine differences between um, some of the ways in which these different agents work. So some of the data with reslizumab, because you can titrate the dose better, suggests that it has some advantage. Uh, mepolizumab is easier to administer. And there's data with the benralizumab that one needs only to give a treatment every eight weeks. So there are little wrinkles with each of these anti-IL-5 agents or IL-5 active agents that um, may make one or the other more uh, attractive for use. That we really don't, can't, uh, those are hard to nail down because the data is not strong on any of those processes, but, but there, are, uh, there are slight differences one could anticipate.
Next slide. Let's see what's next here. And the next slide uh, just identifies TSLP. TSLP is an epithelial cytokine that's in the IL-7 family of cytokines. IL-7 is very important in the thymus during um, specific antigen selection, uh, but TSLP is the epithelial form of that IL-7 family. It uh, skews towards Th2 or type 2 immune response. It activates cells of innate immunity, dendritic cells, mast cells, macrophages, um, uh, monocytes, CD34 positive progenitors, and ILC. So TSLP has a wide range of activation of the cells of innate immunity to skew that response. Genetic variants are associated with atopy, asthma, hyperresponsiveness, and expression correlates with asthma and asthma severity. So it's a very good target. There's preliminary data, for example, on its ability to block a late phase response. That was the initial study in the New England Journal that identified TSLP as an important target in asthma. Next slide. And there's a variety of studies that's been done that have been published in the last year. I forget what the acronym is for their studies. Uh, there's usually some heroic name that's given to these different studies. But the study suggests TSLP is effective and I would expect that approval will happen this year for tezapelumab, which is the monoclonal antibody against TSLP. Next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit about the IL-1 family in allergy and asthma. IL-1 is something I've been studying now for about 40 years. I was uh, uh, one, of the, one of the discoverers of IL-1, and we actually cloned it in the 1980s. But uh, airway and tissue involvement in asthma and allergy of IL-1 has been well documented in these papers. So IL-1 is in asthma and asthmatic airways. IL-1 will activate Th2 and Th17 cells in vivo and in vitro and in mouse models as well as in humans. So IL-1 may be an important factor or cofactor for some of the inflammation in asthma. But more importantly, IL-1 is part of a, a larger family of inflammatory and inflammatory regulatory molecules. Next slide. In which 11 genes in the IL-1 family have been identified. Most of these genes are on chromosome 2Q13, along with the IL-1 receptors, which are in a different family, but also play a role in the physiology of IL-1. The only member of this family that is not on chromosome 2 is IL-33, which is on chromosome 9. And IL-33, as, as a cytokine that activates epithelium, much like TSLP, it skews Th2 and type 2 immune responses through innate lymphoid cell activation in asthma. So IL-1 families members are important. I mentioned how I thought IL-1 was important, and there are three members, IL-1-alpha, beta, and IL-1-RA in the IL-1 family that started off. IL-1-RA is anakinra. It's actually a, a drug that's used in treating juvenile arthritis with great efficacy and a variety of other kinds of agents, a, a variety of other kinds of diseases where IL-1 inhibition is important. But IL-18, IL-37, IL-36, and IL-38 in addition to IL-33, are part of this family. And the family is a mixture of both agonists for inflammation and, and immunity and anti-inflammatory agents that either act as receptor antagonists or uh, anti-inflammatory agents in a variety of ways. And next slide identifies the immunochemistry, if you will, of the family. So IL-1, alpha, beta, and IL-33 are all synthesized as a pre as a pre uh, protein that gets um, cut by uh, by various kinds of uh, proteases to the full length activation molecule. So um, the active IL one beta alpha and IL thirty three are about seventeen kd in length, and they have a precursor molecule that's about a. Uh, uh, 23 kd in size, so uh, there's a precursor formation. IL-1 receptor antagonist is not precursor, but its uh, structure is very similar to IL-1 alpha, IL-1 beta, and IL-33 from a um, crystallographic point of view. 
IL-18 and IL-37 are part of the IL-18 subfamily. IL-37 is an anti-inflammatory agent that will block IL-18 activation. And then IL-36 is a complex family. IL-38 may be an inhibitor of the uh, IL-36 activation. IL-36 and IL-38 have very few publications so far in asthma. A couple of them suggest that they're active in asthma from animal models. But human asthma hasn't been studied for these agents yet, and that may be an important thing that will come up. Because in all of these possibilities, I think there are potential targets that could be utilized in asthma that doesn't respond to some of the other anti-cytokines. Next slide, please, Jordan. Identifies the fact that there at least 10 years there have been three agents that will block IL-1. Rolonicept, which is an IL-1 receptor trap. Canakinumab or Olaris, which is a monoclonal antibody to IL-1, and Anakinra or IL-1-RA that blocks the receptor uh, competitively. There are pluses and minuses to using any of these agents. Most of them are used in the kind of uh, diseases Hal Hoffman has identified, CAPS-type syndromes, cryopyrin-activated receptor syndromes, and a variety of other syndromes, like, for example, adult onset stills disease and juvenile arthritis. So IL-1 blockade is important in those circumstances. And then there are common diseases like gout, which have been shown to be um, effectively suppressed by the administration of Alaris or Canakinumab. So there may be ways in which these agents could be potentially repurposed. I think there is a good possibility that IL-1 does play some role in the inflammation and asthma. It's not the major issue, but it could potentially have value addedness uh, by repurposing some of these molecules for asthma. Next slide uh, looks at IL-33. ST2 is a marker of Th2 lymphocytes and a variety of other cells. It's the actual binding partner for IL-33. Uh, and there's a IL-1 uh, accessory protein that will be activated with IL-33 uh, through the different kinases, et cetera, uh, to be pro-inflammatory. But this is to get type 2 immune response uh, mediated uh, processes. Next slide. Identifies just the way in which IL-33 has been shown to be important for asthma. IL-33 and ST2 are genetically linked to human asthma variety of GWAS studies and other kinds of uh, genetic studies that identify it as uh, being signals in asthma syndromes. Next slide. So in addition to genetic linkage, um, processing of IL-33 is almost exactly t equivalent to the processing in terms of protease activation. It's predominantly caspase-1 within cells, but cathepsin G, elastase, and PR3, which is also the target for ANCA in some of the vasculitides, all will cleave the precursor of IL-1, alpha, beta, and IL-33 to the actual mature cytokine that's biologically active. Next slide. Um, the IL-33 has the same range of activating pro-inflammatory cells that we saw with IL-1 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, so there's a variety of these inflammatory cells important in allergic responses, including type 2 innate lymphoid cells uh, that are important for, uh, for a variety of, uh, of activities. And it makes IL-33, next slide, an attractive target in clinical trials. A number of clinical trials have been started. There was one clinical trial with anti-IL-33 and atopic dermatitis that was not very promising but I don't know if that agent is the best agent that could potentially be utilized. And I know that there's efficacy associated with another agent. Let's get to that on the next slide. Uh, just to mention about IL-17 and TH-17 playing a role in asthma. Um, there are really potent agents that have been approved for blocking IL-17 pathways. Next slide. Uh, and they've been approved in uh, psoriasis. Uh, this is the IL-17 family. There are six genes. IL-17E is actually IL-25, which we've touched on, 
as an epithelial activator in asthma and type 2 immune responses. But IL-17A and F are gene products that, pro, uh, that activate profibrotic chemokines. They play a role in other kinds of diseases. And the genetics of the IL-17 family in particular, IL-17E, is linked to asthma. Next slide. There have been a number of trials over the number of years that identifies TH17-mediated autoimmune disease, and these are agents that interact and block IL-6 receptor, IL-17 receptor, and IL-17 itself. All of them have been approved in psoriasis, for example. Some of them have been approved for RA and lupus as well. So it's been established that you can block IL-17 in some of these diseases. The idea was blocking asthma with some of these agents as an important factor. But the earliest clinical trials were not very, in, not very rewarding. Next slide. The reason why those early trials didn't work was that perhaps IL-17 is not so important to the disease process. It's association with disease expression, not necessarily detrimental. Wrong patients and inappropriate endpoints were used in some of the anti-IL-17 therapy. But... Um, you know, it's possible with the wrong dose and the right patient selection or the right dose with the right patient selection that anti-IL-17 will work. But at this point, most of the drug companies have viewed IL-17 as an important factor in the treatment of psoriasis and the other autoimmune diseases and don't want to risk that um, those clear positive uh, uh, indications by doing uh, asthma studies or other atopic dermatitis studies. Next slide. So um, for the newer treatments, we've gone through omalizumab and the anti-IL-5 agents and dupilumab. Anti-TSLP, tezapelumab will be available, I believe, within a year. And anti-IL-33, Regeneron 3500, is itapecumab. Uh, I think that will eventually be approved within two years. Um, there's a small company, Ana, Anaptosis Bio, that made etokimab that was tried in a very small proof-of-concept study done at Stanford in atopic dermatitis that did not have um, remarkable uh, activity. So uh, I'm not sure that etokimab will have any kind of approval pathway. But I think etapecumab clearly does look promising in the early clinical trials, and we would expect, um, if things progress, that it will come eventually to approval. Tezapelumab, I think it's almost, uh, if it hasn't been approved yet, it will be shortly. Okay, let's finish up one more slide or two. Um, there's a, a lot of considerations as to which of the biologic pathways one picks. There's no proven data for precision medicine for any of these things yet, but this slide is a representation from uh, Gina, I believe, about how to think in that way, and it's worth going through, uh, but it's really, with the absence of data, uh, hard to suggest why you would pick one or the other pathway. Next slide. Since there are no, uh, this just is a summary. Next slide of all the things that we need to do to learn more about asthma. That'll help us try and figure out what the phenotypes, endotypes are that are real, as opposed to all the stuff that's mostly written that's fanciful about really selecting the right kind of treatment for the right kind of patient. We don't know that yet. We need to learn more about the actual pathogenesis of the complex disease process to learn that. That's the kind of thing I said 15 years ago when I was president of the Quad AI and gave the presidential lecture. Next slide. I think there's only one left or two. Yeah, so trying to figure out how all of this works. I think uh, the suggestions I made in 2004, uh, looking at allergy asthma 2030 still hold. Biotherapeutics, I think, is here to stay. And probably for the next 50 years will be the most important aspects of treatment. But pharmacogenetic profiling and interven early intervention is still a goal, and we don't yet have data for that. So I th think we're done. 
I don't know if we have any time for questions. I don't know if I'll be taking over for uh, Dan Hamelis' time. But if you uh, have any questions, can anybody uh, hear me? Yep, we're still here. Hello? Yeah, Lanny, we're still here. Can you hear us? Jordan? Yeah, can you, can you hear us? Uh, Dr. Miller's been talking. Are you able to hear us? Hello? 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 Hey, Jordan, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up here. Okay. And, and okay. If, if you could type yeah, a message. If you could type a message to Lanny that we uh, we can hear him, but unfortunately. Hello, can anybody hear me? Yeah, I don't think we have time for questions. Dan Hamelos is on deck. Tell him to do well. He He's a good baseball player, so he'll like the on deck reference. And uh, it's been a pleasure to interact with Kohler over the years. I'll be glad to answer any questions that people have offline. My email is lrosenwasser334 at gmail.com. If any of the first or second year fellow or any else, anyone else is listening, please, uh, please contact me if you have any questions. Okay. So, sorry, we had a little sound trouble okay. here at the end. Lanny, we do appreciate um, this very enlightening talk on the pathogenesis of asthma. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about this historical perspective and how far we've come through the years, just in like 30, 40 years. It's been amazing. We've um, significant improvement yeah, no. understanding this. Uh, no, I, I, I would imagine most of your fellows have no idea who Barry Kay is. Barry Kay passed away in the last year, but he was uh, very important for in the early understanding of a so-called TH2 origin of asthma. And uh, like I said, um, you know, uh, a lot of the people are, uh, are fading away who did a lot of the in, important work. But there's no question that the pathogenesis is, has led to important treatments, and uh, that's where the state of the art is at this point. So hope everybody does well. Anybody have any questions, email them to me, lrosenwasser. 334 at gmail.com. Be glad to answer any questions that come up about the presentation or anything else. Best of luck, Chris. Take care. All right. Thank you, Lanny. We appreciate you being here today. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you all. Take care.